We heard the ending of Luke's Gospel, which tells of the ascension of Jesus into heaven. And what we also know is that Luke is the author of Acts, and so Luke opens the book of Acts by retelling the story of the ascension of Jesus. So hear now God's word from Acts chapter 1, beginning at the first verse. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up into heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? And he replied, It is not for you to know the time or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he has said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Some years ago, I was on a trip with the Outreach Foundation of our church to visit Presbyterian churches and congregations in Brazil. On one clear night, we were far away from the lights of the city. We looked up. We looked up. And we saw the heavens filled with countless stars, more stars than I have ever seen before. And for the first time in my life, I saw the Southern Cross and now realized that I was looking at a different night sky than what I see at home. When we gaze at the stars in the night, we have some idea of what David felt when he wrote, the heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. At the end of the Gospel of Luke and at the beginning of the book of Acts, Luke tells us that after the resurrection, Jesus spends 40 days with the disciples, instructing them about all that he had said and preparing for them for the days ahead when they would be his witnesses in the world. And when Jesus is lifted up from the earth, a cloud covers him. The disciples can't take their eyes off the sight of God's handiwork. And they remember that he had told them that they would be his witnesses in all the world. And from that moment, they began to tell others what they knew to be true about Jesus. Well, on Ascension Sunday, what did they tell him? They tell others that the resurrection of Jesus is not the end of the story. Jesus ascends from this earth into heaven to rule over heaven and earth. In the creed, we say that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, It is a place of honor, intimacy, power. Now Luke is the only writer in the New Testament to give us an actual vivid image of the ascension of Jesus into heaven. And yet the the idea of his ascending to be with God is scattered throughout the New Testament. And the cloud which takes Jesus from their sight is not some cloud coverage on an overcast day. The cloud in the Bible is the sign of God's glory. Jesus is enfolded, enwrapped, enclosed, supported, lifted up by the glory of God. Do you remember in the wilderness wanderings when the children of Israel were clueless and lost and they wandered from one place to another? They would have been lost forever had it not been for the cloud that guided them by day and the pillar of fire by night. 
Jesus is, you might say, our North Star. He is our Southern Cross. We feast upon him, we fix our eyes on him, we gaze at him, and he shows us the way. Jesus rules over heaven and earth. The ascension of Jesus affirms that no matter how things may appear, the Lord reigns. His reign may sometimes seem to, to be hidden, sometimes misunderstood, but his way is God's way in the world. And what is that way? It is the path of self-giving love. Such love is the only power strong enough to transform human hearts, the only power strong enough to change the course of human history. Force may restrain evil, but only love can transform evil. Walls may separate hostile communities, but only love can change enemies into friends. Being popular at school may be a great thing for a while, but only love can sustain a life forever. You know, even though we only see glimpses of the power of Jesus and the courageous sacrifices today of the people of faith, we believe that one day his rule over heaven and earth will be manifest so that all eyes may see and every knee shall bow. And the saints are those who keep their eyes fixed on Jesus and live their lives through others, through the power of forgiveness, generosity, justice, and peace. And the saints, they're not just those we know by name. They're not just those whom history remembers. They're not just those who have their special days. No, the saints are people like you and me. They're people who raise their children to know and to love Jesus who build ramps for people imprisoned in their homes because they have been set free by Jesus, who stand up for kids at school who get picked on because Jesus has stood up for them, who provide food for the hungry because Jesus has fed them in the bread and the wine, who teach the Bible to a new generation because they have learned to see Jesus through the words of Scripture, who work to reconcile their neighbors because they have been reconciled to God. You and I, Paul says, in the opening words of his first letter to the Corinthians, are called to be saints together. We, through our deeds and our words, tell what we know to be true about Jesus. Now, I know the world may think such small acts are not important, but in the eyes of Jesus, they mean everything. For we stand as witnesses to the reign of Jesus over heaven and earth. We tell what we know. And when we affirm that Jesus ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, we are also declaring that the risen Lord, fully human, fully divine, enters into the heavenly realm. He brings our humanity into the very heart of God. Jesus does not shed his human nature and float off like some Casper the friendly ghost. No. He does not dispose of his bodily form, his humanity, to enter into the heavenly places. No, he goes as the incarnate Son of God, fully divine, fully human. We no longer see the Lord in the flesh because he is with the Lord in heaven, but we are witnesses of these things. The 20th century theologian Karl Barth, whom our theologian in residence John Frankie has been teaching, focused much of his writings on the otherness, the holiness of God, and the vast separation between God and humanity. Only because of God's great love for us in Jesus Christ can we even know about God, Barth declares. Only God's love for us in Jesus Christ can overcome that vast Grand Canyon that separates us from God but God turns towards us in Jesus God becomes one of us in Jesus God enfolds us in divine grace in Jesus just like a mother enfolds a newborn child in her arms in Jesus God embraces our humanity and through the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, Bart declares that we can now speak not only of the holiness and the otherness of God, but we can speak of the humanity of God. Bart writes that the deity of God 
encloses humanity in itself. This means that in the ascension of Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus Christ is our advocate in the very being of God. He knows what it is to be human. He knows what it is to feel disappointment and pain and to rejoice in the good times. William Plaker has written that Jesus, our friend and brother, who knows the beauties and the sorrows of this earth so intimately, is there in the highest place of honor and influence. All this is to say that when we understand what the ascension is all about, then we understand that Jesus brings our deepest needs to God. We are never alone. And even in those moments of life when God seems so unapproachable, so distant, we remember and we know that Jesus is there as our advocate with God. He intercedes for us. He prays for us. Some years ago, in a former congregation, a young man began visiting the church. He seemed to be such an incredibly happy young man. He had a ton of friends. He had a great job. And so one day over lunch, I asked him about his, his, his life. I said, you know, you've got this incredible attitude. You seem so positive. Tell me about yourself. And he said, well, he laughed. I wasn't always like this. I wasn't always so happy. In fact, I was miserable in middle school. I felt awkward. I had no real friends. I didn't fit in anywhere. I was bullied by the other kids. I was afraid, anxious, depressed. The only thing that kept me going was what my middle school youth advisor used to say to us all. She'd say, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what is happening to you now, Jesus is with you. He loves you. And he takes your pain to the very heart of God. He said it was her words that kept me through those years of pain until I was able to love myself as I knew Jesus loved me. He was telling what he knew. When we tell what we know of Jesus, we tell not only that he rules over heaven and earth, not only that he bears our pains in the very heart of God, but we know that he sends his power to be with us. He ascends into heaven not to, to disappear from our sight forever, not to dis distance himself from us, but so that he may come and be with us in a new way, an even more intimate way in the Holy Spirit who dwells in our hearts and our minds. He stays with the disciples to teach them everything that has happened, to help them understand what they are called to do, and he promises then to send the Spirit to be their guide and mentor. And the Spirit will give them courage to witness in a dangerous word. The Spirit will give them the word to speak when they are all but speechless. The Spirit will give them comfort when they fall flat on their faces. When he goes away, he goes away so that he might come and be with them again. And the Spirit will take these stammering, stuttering disciples and transform them into apostles to spread the good news of Jesus. And next Sunday on Pentecost... We will hear more about the work of the Spirit who forms and empowers the people of God. But today we simply need to know that though Jesus has ascended into heaven, he has not left us alone. He is with us in the Holy Spirit so that you and I may participate in his ministry in the world. The Spirit gives us courage and wisdom and comfort. It gives us the right word to say when our minds go blank. And it happens to all of us. And we stumble for words. Jesus sends us out to be witnesses, to tell what we know, just like those first disciples. And what about them? What about those first disciples? Did you hear what the Scripture said when Jesus ascends into heaven? What are they doing? They're standing there. Look at them up there, looking up in heaven, wondering, gazing. What next? Stammering, stuttering, thinking, I don't know what to do. What do we do now? And there's a little more than a bit of irony in the words of the angels to those disciples. It's as if the angels give them a strong jab in the ribs and say, Hey, why do you keep staring off into space? Get on with it. Didn't he tell you 
to stay in Jerusalem until you get power from on high. I wonder if those first disciples wouldn't have stayed there all day and all night gazing at the stars if those angels hadn't told them to get on with the business of doing what Jesus asked. Tell what you know. Sometimes we have a hard time with that. Sometimes we just rather gaze at the stars and look at the night sky instead of getting on with it. Isn't it interesting that the much beloved and central window of our beautiful sanctuary is the window of the ascension of Jesus? For those of you who are new to our congregation, you may not know that this window is so beloved that it was brought from the downtown church The window's over 100 years old, 110, 11 years old, made by Tiffany in 1905. Well, all that's nice, but that's not what it's really about. It's about keeping our eyes on Jesus. It's about getting on with the work that Jesus has called us to do. But we love looking at this window. I love looking at this window. And I sometimes, when I'm sitting out there, just kind of get lost looking at that window. And you know what? I need an angel to come up and give me a big jab in the ribs and say, okay, look at the window, keep your eyes on Jesus. But remember what Jesus says. You are to tell what you know. You are to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all the world. You're to be his witnesses in Carmel and Fishers and South Indianapolis and wherever you go off to college and wherever you live and work and where you go to school. Our vocation, our calling in life is told right here in this window. We are to be his witnesses. And this morning we're receiving our marvelous confirmation class. What a joy. And I want to say a word to you, and the rest of you can overhear. In professing your faith in Jesus Christ today, you are promising to tell what you know to be his witnesses wherever you go, to tell about your experiences of God, to be honest with your questions, to stand up for what is right and good for the Lord, to tell that Jesus rules both heaven and earth, to tell others who are suffering that Jesus takes your pain into the very heart of God, and to tell others that Jesus will give you strength to be his witnesses in the world. Now, look at the window. Get a good, long look at the window. Now go and tell what you know. Amen.